What's up, gangsters? It is time for yet another one of my favorite kind of videos, and one that I haven't done in a long time. Um, and that is a paint test. Now, I like doing paint tests, and the truth is, um, I would be testing paint whether you guys were watching or not. Um, it's just it's just really important to me to know what a material is going to do and how it's going to behave under different circumstances before I commit to splattering it all over something that I've built. And so I, 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 like, I like paint testing and I have lots of paint chips and paint mules of different kinds laying around here and um, it's just part of my whole process. But I know that uh, you guys uh, like hearing about that sort of thing as well, even though, yeah, I know, my paint tests take forever. <laughs> I think every single one that I've done has been like uh, either an hour long video or a couple of, of you know, a two part thing with each part being an hour long or whatever. And, you know, it is what it is. If that's too long for you, I don't have any sympathy because uh, there is the pause button. But more fundamentally than that, I, you know, paint is the, is the point in the model making process where the rubber meets the road. And you can either create something that is truly rewarding uh, that you can enjoy looking at for years to come. Or you can completely ruin all of the hard work you've put into your project up to that point. So, to me, if you want to know the straight scoop, you got to spend the time. Whether that means testing it yourself or watching some idiot like me test it. So, anyway, I know you guys are like, well, what paint are you going to test? So this is one that I've been wanting to do for a long time. This is going to be a test of gravity colors. And if you're not familiar, which I think you'd have to be living under a rock not to be, Gravity Colors is um, a very popular uh, and up-and-coming brand of paint that's specifically built for scale car modelers. Um, the, uh, the owner of Gravity Color is a really cool guy named Mate Meyer. And he lives in Florida, and he's a, a total enthusiast and just a really nice guy. And he's committed to getting finishes that look really good at scale. Um, that comes into play with things like metallics. Um, and just getting the really high quality, predictable paints that work well with styrene um, and that are color accurate. So, because we all know that. With all of these cars, uh, there's automotive color codes, and you know, we've with race cars, there's particular colors that are accurate. I mean, it's even more contentious, I think, than color accuracy in the military modeling circles. So, anyway, Mate is really committed to all of that stuff, and that's what he's built the Gravity Paint brand around. Um, and, um, Speaking of the Gravity Paint brand, there's probably something that I should address right up front because some of you guys are probably already familiar with the fact that there was a little bit of drama with the Gravity Paint brand last year. And I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version of what happened um, based on things that, that Mate has told me and that other people who have talked to him have told me. Um, Mate was selling both in the United States and in Europe. And he had a partner who was handling the stuff over uh, over there. Um, I guess they had a little bit of a disagreement because Mate is very strict about um, the way the paints are made, the way the paints are packaged, um, all of those things that basically support the quality of the brand. Um, I think one thing that they had a disagreement about was the quality of the bottles. Um, the guy in Europe wanted to use glass bottles. Mate wanted to use these plastic bottles because the, the glass bottles were breaking and leaking and causing issues. There were also some, some, I guess, some things about formulation. Anyway, bottom line is they just didn't agree. And um, then they kind of split up. You had a little bit of a breakup, and I guess the handling of the, of the Gravity Colors Facebook page and website and graphics 
and all of that stuff got contentious and anyway I, I don't know all the exact details but bottom line is this both of them are still as I understand it uh, selling paint but the guy in Europe is basically completely on his own has nothing to do with the stuff going on in the United States um, and so you would ask well which one is the real gravity colors and I would say unequivocally that Gravity Colors USA, as run by Matte Meyer, is the real Gravity Colors. And the way that you can tell for sure is if your paint is in a plastic bottle. That's definitely one way. Um, but you can also look at some of the graphics. The bottom line is Matte created all of the graphics and marketing materials and web collateral for the company, and he owns all of it. So. Um, that's the best way I know to explain what went on. Um, you know, if you have questions about it, I'm sure you could message Mate and, and he'll tell you straight up. He's a super nice guy. He's normally real responsive to, uh, you know, messages on Facebook. Um, but he is also a small business guy and sometimes he gets swamped and he's got a family and sometimes these things uh, will, will slow him down when it comes to processing orders. But uh, bear with him because it's definitely worth the wait. Anyhow, um, I don't do a lot of car models or motorcycle models, um, and so I haven't had a really good excuse to want to test this stuff, but I finally just got overwhelmed by curiosity, and I do plan to do something that's glossy at some point in 2018, so I thought, well, you know, now's as good a time as any. So, um, Matte and I chatted, and he sent me a little box of uh, test samples that I've got right here on my bench. And I am going to do my usual, hopefully thorough and fair job of wearing this stuff out. So, without further jaw flapping on my part, let's get right into it. Okay, first things first, let's just take a look at what, uh, what Mate sent me. Uh, one of the things that I definitely have been wanting to try is this um, burnt copper orange. I think this would look super cool on something custom with black wheels or something like that. I don't know, I've got ideas for this. But it's a really neat color. Now I haven't shaken it up yet because I want you guys to be able to see something that's really important here. This is a metallic. Now look down here at the bottom of it and you can see where, you know, this has been sitting on my shelf for close to a month now and you can see where all of the metallic pigments have settled down there. And I think you can see, um, you can get an idea of how fine these pigments are. And this is something that's really important to Mate. Um, I, I see a lot of, of metallic paint jobs on car models that honestly, to me, they just look terrible because the, pig, the metal flakes, the pigments, whatever, are just so large that it makes it look like the thing has been painted with, with gravel. And I just think it really detracts from the appearance of what might otherwise be a really nice car model. Mate also agrees with that. And so he has um, taken great care to select only the extra smallest size pigments for his paints. Apparently that's just one of those things that you can specify when you have this stuff blended. He said that it adds about 15% uh, cost to the paints. But, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but for me, faith, that it would be cheap at twice the price to get a, a good scale pigment result. And uh, I definitely think that they do a good job of that. Everything I've seen with these paints, Dave Thibodeau, if you're not familiar with him, is a, is a, is a world-class car modeler and his work is, you know, visible on Facebook. And he's done some metallic stuff with gravity colors and uh, has, has got some really good videos on YouTube uh, showing it as well. And it's, it does, it looks good. So let's just take a quick look here at what it says on the bottle. Uh, let's just look at, the, you know, if there's anything important we need to know about here. Uh, this is the basic uh, shake thoroughly, color matched airbrush ready base coat scale model paint, apply over white or gray primer, use clear coat for glossy finish, use a well ventilated area, tighten cap securely after each use. Okay, so um, these are lacquer paints. Uh, so that's, you know, why you want to make sure you're working in a well-ventilated area. Um, 
base coat is an important word because what you need to understand is that these are like most full-scale automotive paints it's a base coat clear coat system which means that when you shoot this it's going to come out in basically a flat or a semi-gloss finish and in order to get a full wet look automotive gloss you're going to have to go over it with a clear coat which we'll talk about later uh, so let's see what else this says. It gives you the part number, what it is, a little uh, scan code, wear a respirator, do not swallow. <laughs> That's always good advice. Um, and shake well. I think you could also hear before that it has a mixing ball already in it, which is really nice. I wish every single paint manufacturer would do this. Um, and I don't expect that I'm going to get it completely shaken up. I can't. I, shaking paint is one thing that's miserable for me. I can't. I can't move my arm fast enough, and I don't have wrist flexibility. So shaking paint is is a hassle for me. And normally I would open it up and stir it. But you can see that you know I got it shaken pretty well, at least with that much. And the pigment is starting to come off the bottom, and uh, you can start to see. What a really cool color that that's going to be. So anyway, that that I think is a good example of um, the metallics from Gravity Color. Now, obviously, he also has some other stuff that is uh, not metallic. I mean, he's got a wide variety of stuff. This is a pretty neat color. This is Chevrolet Black Rose which as you can see is kind of a metallic dark purple. And I like that he gives you a picture of the car that it's supposed to be matched to right here on the label. Um, that's a nice touch where I think it, you know, kind of gives you a, an instant sort of reference for what it is. Now this one is a non-metallic color. Uh, this one's called Coca-Cola Red. Um, now this bottle is a little bit different says right here on it. Let's read this. Factory color, airbrush ready, base coat, scale model paint, apply over white or gray primer, which you don't have to, but for colors like red, really any brilliant color, um, white or gray is, is a good color primer to use because uh, it, it, you, you don't have to cover quite as much as if it's a black primer and, and you will get more uh, brilliant colors. So I think that's good advice. Um, do not spray wet coats. So basically what he's saying is don't flood it on there, which is pretty normal for just about any type of paint. Um, you, you want it to only be as wet as it has to be. Um, so I, I think, you know, he's pretty well covered the bases there. Uh, let's give this one a quick shake and take a look at that. So again, not probably not completely shaken up, but not too bad either. You can see that's just a nice, brilliant red. So I've got several different paints to try. Um, I also have, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Speaking of primers, this is an interesting thing. This is a new product for Gravity. 2K White Surface Primer. Now you did read that correctly. And, and if you're not familiar, you may be asking, well, what does 2K mean? 2K is basically a paint industry term that means it's a two-part material, meaning that it has to be mixed with a catalyst in order for it to cure. If I just poured this out of the bottle into my airbrush and sprayed it, it would be sticky forever as far as I know. It has to have that catalyst in order to cause what's called a cross-linking reaction. And basically, you can think of a cross-linking reaction as the same thing that happens when you mix up a, uh, a little bit of five-minute epoxy. Once those two components are combined, they basically lock together uh, to form a rigid material. And the same thing happens with these, uh, with these 2K urethane paints. Now, um, <laughs> I should also point out that um, if, if you've heard anything about 2K, you may, also, you may immediately be saying, well, I've heard that it's really toxic. Okay, so the deal with 2K paints is this. 
when the two materials, the resin and the catalyst, get together to do their cross-linking thing, they produce, uh, and I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert chemist, so I'm kind of giving you my layman's version of all this. But what happens is they produce these compounds called isocyanates. And isocyanates are a known carcinogen. They are not good for you. You don't want them in your system. So it's really important when you're working with 2K urethanes that you have, number one, a very good quality uh, like a DuPont or a 3M uh, paint mask that's rated for volatile organic compounds, vapors, not just one that filters out solids like a dust mask. And ideally, you should be working in a spray booth that's got positive airflow away from you uh, so that you just, you know, you're not getting any of that stuff on you. Now, for the volumes that that we spray as model makers, a little bit of 2K exposure is not going to cause you to grow a third nipple, okay? You don't have to panic. It's not like that. It is just definitely something that you want to be cautious of. Don't, you know, don't do anything stupid. Wear gloves while you're working with it. Don't get the stuff on you. Um, you know, wear a mask, work in a ventilated spray booth, etc. Now, um, since I keep talking about the resin and the catalyst, this is the point to talk about this most important bit of instructions on the label for this, prim for this primer. Mixing ratio is four to one. So what happens is, and it says right here, mix four parts primer with one part activator. And so you've got, let's see here, gloss clear thinner primer activator. Okay, so that's this stuff right here. So you want four parts of this to one part of this. And once you do that, you've got a limited amount of time to use the stuff before it starts to harden. Now, is that a matter of minutes? Do you have to rush right to it? No, you don't. You've got a little bit of time. Uh, but obviously, you don't want to wait around forever. And most importantly, you never want to leave a 2K material in your airbrush after you're finished. <laughs> because once it hardens, you might as well just throw your airbrush away and go buy a new one. It's tough stuff. So you want to make sure and clean out your, your equipment immediately anytime you're you know spraying a, a 2K material. So that's the basic deal with anything that's a two-part urethane. You will hear people sometimes refer to 1K paints, and that's kind of a misnomer where they will talk about a like a clear gloss lacquer being a 1K clear. That's not really like good terminology. Uh, it is true that there are single part uh, 1K urethanes, um, but all that means is that you don't have to mix them with a catalyst like you do with this 2K primer. They catalyze with exposure to oxygen. So th that's why they're called a 1K, and that's why it also doesn't really apply to just a, a regular old lacquer. It's really a urethane thing. Anyway, so um, I'm going to be trying this stuff out. Um, it's supposed to be, a, according to Mate, just a really good, solid uh, automotive type primer that should work for basically anything that we, you know, would use one for on a uh, on a car model. So I'll be checking that out to see how well it sprays and sands and fills and does all those things that you want a, a primer to do. All right, now, uh, speaking of 2Ks, then we also have this 2K Gloss Clear. So this stuff is what you need for that really wet, glossy automotive shine on a car or motorcycle model. Um, and as I've explained, it works the same way uh, where you've got a uh, the resin and then you've got an activator uh, right here, 2K Gloss Clear Activator. Now, I have not asked Mate this. I suspect this activator and this activator are the same, but I'm not going to mess with uh, trying that theory out. Uh, we're going to assume that, that it's unique to be used just for the primer. But the mechanism is the same. Once you mix these two things together, you cause a cross-linking reaction that will turn this into a very hard, durable acrylic, uh, sorry, not acrylic, a urethane shell. Now the mixing ratios are a little bit different on this clear, three to one to one. 
that's three parts of clear to one part of the activator to uh, one part uh, gloss clear thinner. Now, those ratios are somewhat adjustable. In fact, Carlos Starton, who I'm sure you guys know is one of the best uh, motorcycle model makers, best model makers period on the planet, uh, but, his but his motorcycle models are just truly world class. And the gloss finishes that he gets are truly amazing. Um, and he's been experimenting with the, uh, with the, with the 2K uh, clear from Gravity. And he's adjusted the ratios a little bit. And we'll talk about that whenever I get to actually spraying this stuff. Um, if I remember correctly, he's doing 3 to 1.5 to 1.5. And it feels like he's getting a little bit better result. But at any rate, we'll, get, we'll talk more about that when we actually get to spraying it. Uh, anyway, it's important to uh, to read the rest of this stuff. Mix three parts clear with one part activator and one part thinner. Spray a mist layer first, wait five minutes, then spray wet coats. Clear will begin to cure in 45 minutes, dries completely overnight. So um, this is important. That tack layer is what you want to make sure that you've got basically uh, kind of a sticky coat so that you don't get runs when you go on with your wet layers. And what I typically do is I do one tack layer and then two wet layers. But different people do different things. Carlos, for example, um, tends to do uh, the same thing, but then he'll flatten, uh, which means to sand back the, uh, the gloss, apply decals, and then do two more uh, wet layers on top of that. Uh, for his uh, GP bikes that have a lot of decals on them, uh, you know, there's there's different there's different ways to do it. But the bottom line is, you're going to end up with between three and five layers of this clear uh, by the time it's all said and done. Okay, uh, so that covers the uh, the uh, urethane clear. Okay, now let's talk about the other thing here that's pretty cool, and that is this uh, chrome effect. Now this is specifically for this McLaren F1 car that has a kind of a chrome finish to it. And so what we've got is a, a base coat. Uh, well, I shouldn't say base coat because this chrome paint really is the color coat. Um, but that's supposed to give us that chrome finish. Now, as with a lot of chrome paints, this one needs a gloss black base underneath it, and Mate has also sent me that. And um, that's not it. This is it. Okay, this is the high gloss black. Okay, now this does not say that it's a 2K paint, um, but it does say that it needs to be activated with 1K activator. <laughs> There we go, totally confusing what I was saying before about um, 1K and 2K. I'm not sure why he's calling this a 1K activator. To me, if it's two parts, it's a, ure it's, it's a 2K. And I don't know that this is a urethane. Um, I forgot that this was a two-part system uh, when I was talking to Mate last, and I will ask him about it before I actually lay some of this down and confirm whether or not it's a urethane or a lacquer. It doesn't really matter, because you need to do exactly what it says on this label right here and use this activator. So that will give us the gloss black base that we need uh, to then lay down the chrome finish. Now, what happens after that? Again, I need to, I'm reminded now that I need to ask Mate about this, um, is whether or not we need to clear coat it. And it does say use a clear coat for a glossy finish. So this basically says the same thing that his other paints do. The fact that it's a chrome finish notwithstanding. Why that's a little surprising to me and maybe to some of you guys is because if you've ever messed with something like All Clad's ALC 107, um, which is their chrome uh, finish, you know that putting any kind of a clear coat over the top of it that's hot will totally wreck it. You may have a nice reflective polished aluminum look after you spray it, but as soon as you spray something like a clear gloss lacquer or a, or a, a clear gloss uh, urethane, it 
the pigments float and it basically turns into silver paint. You completely ruin the chrome effect. And the only way to maintain it with a clear coat is to use a water-based clear. And that's one of the disadvantages of, of, of those type chrome finishes is that uh, you can't handle them without a clear coat because they're so fragile. Um, and uh, you know they'll rub off with basically any amount of handling. But when you do put a clear coat, you modify the appearance of it and it may not look quite as authentic anymore. So it's gonna be interesting to me to see how this one turns out, um, how it looks right after we spray it um, and how it looks once uh, it has a clear coat on it. So lots of interesting stuff here. I'm looking forward to doing this test. I think it's gonna be pretty cool and uh, uh, I think you guys are gonna agree that this is really good stuff if you are uh, building car models. All right, so it's time to get started. But uh, before I do that, I wanna basically lay out uh, my test plan because this one's gonna actually be pretty simple. Um, I've got two uh, test pieces here that I'm gonna work with. This one here on the right, I'm gonna prime with the 2K white surface primer that Mate sent me. And then, I'm going to probably put two colors on this piece. Uh, I'll probably put the chrome on, or well, I'll probably put the gloss black base on it, or at least part of it. Um, I'm gonna ask Mate if uh, the uh, gloss black base can go under other colors, or if it's really only good for the chrome. Anyway, so I'll have some chrome on here, and then I'll probably have one of the other uh, metallic colors. And then when that's all done, I will uh, I'll, I'll hit it with the uh, 2K Gloss Clear. Now, this other test piece here is for a specific experiment that I want to run based on some negative experiences that I had with zero paint. Now, if you guys have kept up with any of my nonsense, you know that uh, a little over a year ago, I built the Tamiya uh, Honda RC213V MotoGP bike and that in that project I have some very significant problems with zero paint, which I talked about, and which earned me all kinds of internet hate from both the owner of Zero <laughs> and uh, his legions of fanboys. But the bottom line is, as far as I can tell, and this has been witnessed by other model makers, many of whom are much better at this than I am, uh, is that zero stuff is very hot, at least some of it. Um, some of the colors, I've had multiple experiences where spraying it in a normal way, um, at least normal for me, uh, caused it to craze the plastic all the way through the primer. Now, um, other model makers have seen this as well, but the effect seems to be limited to lacquer primers. Um, one guy that I've talked to a lot who I totally trust because he is just so good at this has tested zero paints with both Tamiya lacquer primer and Mr. Surfacer 1500 lacquer primer and had it craze the plastic all the way through the primer in both cases, no matter how he sprays it. Um, and my contention has been um, you shouldn't have to spray something differently in order for it to work. Um, I've been painting for lots and lots of years, and I don't want to, you know, do the whole appeal to authority thing, but for me, the bottom line is that when you are using a consistent method, right or wrong, over a long period of time, and all of your paints work fine using that method or spraying style or whatever you want to call it. And then you have one brand of paint that pops up and causes problems. Well, then there's something different about that paint. Whether it's that's you know a good thing or a bad thing, it, there is definitely something different about that paint. And in this case, that happens to be you know with zero paints uh, being very hot. Now, they tell you, you know, when you read the fine print that you're supposed to go to their website, you know, and read the instructions and blah, blah, blah. And all they really tell you in their instructions is exactly what Gravity says right here on the side of their bottles, which is 
do not spray wet coats, which is pretty normal. Um, now, uh, there's there's a range of of wet coats. Okay, that can mean everything from just maintaining um, a, a little bit of a wet edge to just flat out flooding it on there. Uh, and, you know, there's there's no standard out there in the painting world for exactly what defines a wet coat. But the bottom line is that with pretty much any paint, um, you really don't want to be flooding it on. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that. Uh, Guns GX2 Gloss Black is an exception. <laughs> you can pretty much hose that stuff on and it does great no matter what. Um, Steinal Res, Badger's uh, Acrylic Primer. You can flood that stuff on like a madman and it pretty much does great. But for the most part, moderation is the rule. You start with a light coat, then you do a slightly heavier coat, and then you finish with another heavier, uh, a little heavier coat than that. Uh, the paint has to be a certain amount of wet during that process, or it's either going to be gritty or pebbly or it's not going to stick. So you can't have a completely dry coat even when you do what we call so-called dry spraying. So um, th there's, there's a range there. So what I'm going to do, uh, anyway, the point of all this, <laughs> what I'm going to do is um, I want to test gravity colors the same way, the same way I spray everything else, the same way I sprayed zero, on top of Mr. Surfacer 1500 primer and see if I have any of the same crazing of the plastic that I had with z the zero stuff. Now, I don't believe I will. And, and part of the reason is because um, I, I've talked to Mate about this and he assures me that all of their paints are blended, ready to spray right out of the bottle using thinners that are specifically formulated not to cause problems with polystyrene. In other words, they're just not that hot. He described it as being similar to something like Mr. Color Leveling Thinner, which, as you know, we all know, is uh, mild enough that you can just about dump it on a piece of polystyrene and it won't craze it. Uh, and we know that it's possible to blend paints that way because MRP is a great example. That stuff sprays perfectly right out of the bottle uh, with no issues crazing the plastic whatsoever. So we know it's possible. Uh, and I fully expect that, that, that when I prime this bead, or that, that when I shoot this Coca-Cola red on top of this Mr. Surface for 1500 right here, that I won't see any issues uh, whatsoever. Uh, and when I don't see any issues, after that, I'm going to also hit that piece with the, uh, with the 2K clear gloss. Uh, so, anyway, that's the basic test plan, um, and I think uh, it's time to get started. Okay, so first things first, I'm going to get uh, some primer mixed up here, and I've got these already well shaken and stirred, uh, so we should be ready to go. Now the mix ratio is four to one, which is pretty common. I, I use, uh, I've used UPAL quite a bit, which is a 2K gloss clear that's made for the automotive world, but which works well on scale models. And it also is four to one. So what I'm gonna do is pick numbers that are easy to work with based on my, how my pipettes are graduated. So I'm going to go with two mils of the primer. So I've got about not quite a mil and a half there. And then I've got just a little bit less than a mil there. So I should have right at two mils of paint. Now it's a good idea with these to follow the instructions to the letter. But if you're a little bit off one way or the other, it's not going to be a problem. I have found the 2K that I have worked with to be pretty forgiving. So since I've got two mils of primer in the cup, I need a half mil of 
activator to give me the 4 to 1 ratio. So there we go. That's about right. Just shoot it in there. And you're not going to be able to use these pipettes for anything else after this. So what I like to do then is just use the pipette itself as a mixer. So I'll just suck the, the, the mixed primer up into the pipette a few times and squirt it back out and that's a good way to stir it up. So there I've got two and a half mils of material that's ready to go. Okay, I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to try and narrate this while it's playing in iMovie because the spray booth was just way too loud. Anyway, um, I'm spraying this with my Iwata Neo, which has a 0.35 millimeter needle at 20 PSI. I would normally shoot something like this with my uh, Iwata HPTH, which has a half millimeter needle, and it covers a lot better. Um, but I just feel like this is a lot closer to what most of you guys are going to use. So I think it'll work out fine. Um, anyway, it'll be interesting to see how this surface primer smooths these two pieces out because they have kind of a sordid history. Both of these were paint mules that I had used before, and I stripped the old paint off of them using brake fluid, which works great. But for some reason, I thought I needed to uh, degrease the brake fluid with turpentine. <laughs> I just thought, oh, this will work good. Well, as it turns out, turpentine is strong enough to actually craze the surface of polystyrene. And these parts were jacked up, and I ended up sanding them a whole lot. Okay, so I shot these uh, just a few minutes ago, maybe five minutes ago, about as long as it took me to thoroughly clean out my airbrush, which, as I said before, you definitely want to make sure you do anytime you're working with a, a 2K material. Uh, the smell of fresh 2K is is still uh, uh, pretty strong. I, it can definitely, definitely, I definitely know that that's what's been happening here. But as I would expect with any decent primer, I've been able to pick these parts up and at least handle them lightly without uh, leaving any kind of fingerprints or anything like that, um, other than just from my sweaty fingers. Um, uh, and I would expect to be able to, to get after these with sandpaper uh, within half an hour. But it's almost dinner time, so I won't be doing that until tomorrow. I do want to go ahead and show you, though, what a nice, even, smooth finish these have on them. Um, hopefully, you can see that. Let me get the light down here where it's a little bit brighter. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but... I think you can see uh, that is that is a nice smooth finish. Um, absolutely no texture, no pebbles, no orange peel, no grit, no grain, no nothing. Exactly as a good primer should be. And you may have noticed that that I uh, hosed it on pretty heavily. I think I ended up with probably three layers on most of this. Um, and, and I, I kind of did that on purpose. You can spray primer however you want to, you know, really light, thin layers or really heavy layers. Um, you know, just depending on what your preference is and what your needs are. Obviously, if you've got to do a bunch of sanding, then you need a, a heavier layer of primer. But either way, a good primer should be totally predictable, shouldn't give you any problems. Um, and, and this stuff didn't. I mean, it, it, it sprayed out of there just fine. And you can see that this piece has some evidence of some of the problems I was talking about um, where it got crazed by the turpentine and I, had to, uh, and I had to do a lot of sanding on it. This one was one of the worst. You can actually see maybe on that one uh, right there, there are some little bubbles that, believe it or not, are from the turpentine. <laughs> I had no idea turpentine would do that to, uh, to styrene, um, but sure enough, it did. Um, okay, now I just did a little scratch test there. So this primer is still definitely soft. Obviously, I was able to just dig that right off of there with my fingernail. So 
Um, uh, it's not going to harden up as quickly as a lacquer primer, but uh, again, um, you know, you don't see me just leaving fingerprints in it, so it's not that bad. Um, so um, I will get back to this tomorrow, and we'll see how well this stuff takes the sandpaper. Okay, gangsters, it is now the next morning, um, and it's been, I'd say, I don't know, like 18 hours since I sprayed this primer, and I haven't touched it uh, since uh, last night. I came by my workbench at about 10, and that's about five hours after I sprayed it, and I did another quick fingernail test, and you can see that's that it's that upper scratch. You can see that I was in fact able to, to uh, remove some of it, and it came off pretty easily. Uh, so let's do another fingernail test. All right, I am able to put some nicks in it, but it is definitely much harder than it was uh, last night. Um, no doubt about it. I mean, I'm, again, I'm still able to dig at it, but it, it is definitely much harder than it was last night. Just to compare, this is Mr. Surfacer 1500 that's been on here for, pff, I don't know, a month probably. Um, and I can't, I can't scratch it. Well, there I was able to finally dig through it and make a little, a little nick there. Come on, camera. Get it together. There we go. So, um, I, I would say that this primer is a little bit softer when fully cured, but that's not necessarily a disadvantage. I, I, um, it had a good conversation. I posted a picture of this last night on SMCG and immediately got some questions about, you know, well, what is the advantage of a 2K primer? And uh, Mate was good enough to answer that, and I did went off did a little bit of research on my own. And the combination, the consensus of all of that, it seems to basically be that for us, the number one advantage is that uh, this is a relatively high build primer that levels out very nicely. Um, and you can see it is it is a little bit thicker even with just the three coats, but it is super satiny smooth. I mean, it, this shows up a lot better last than it did last night. There is zero texture on there. And it seems like that the full-scale body shop guys who are all about this stuff um, like it better than a traditional uh, just single-stage lacquer primer is because of that smoothness making it much easier to sand out which of course is more profitable for those guys. Less time they spend with sandpaper, then the more money they make. So it's understandable why they like it for that reason. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess the other one other thing they said is, is that it shrinks less than a regular primer, which I don't know that that really matters much for us, but um, so it seems like uh, of, all of, of all of those things that the advantage for us as model makers is that it does provide a very smooth primer layer that that uh, may require little to no dressing before you lay a, uh, a color coat on top of it, which is great. I can't see myself really wanting to mix up a primer just for incidental stuff, but given the way that it lays down, I can see myself doing it for a model car body. Um, or maybe for, uh, you know, the uh, glossy parts on a motorcycle project. It would be, it might be worth doing it for that. Um, so, you know, I think from all of, of those uh, considerations that this is looking like really good stuff. Now, uh, let's see how it sands. But before I forget to, to do that, I need to address one question that... Um, I, I asked Mate last night, which was, are the activators all the same? And he was very clear that they are not all the same. The primer activator is its own thing. The activator for the clear is its own thing. 
the activator for this gloss black base is its own thing. So be very careful and don't get them mixed up. And he's helped you uh, in that respect uh, with, with what I think is really good labeling. Um, this gloss black activator has a black label on top of it. Um, the act, the, 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 the color of the labels on the tops of these two bottles are the same, but they don't say the same thing. One says surface primer activator, one says multi-use gloss clear activator, and they have different part numbers. So, uh, you know, don't do, uh, don't do the bad thing and get them mixed up. Anyway, now we need to see how this stuff sands. So, First thing I'm going to do is just get a piece of pretty well-worn 240 grit sanding sponge that is kind of my go-to rough sanding tool. And let's see what happens when we uh, get on this. It's certainly not peeling, which would be a disaster. I mean, that's the kind of thing we would expect from a lousy acrylic primer um, and it's dusting up nicely I mean you can see the dust there that's an indicator that it's sanding well and uh, and it is I mean it's you know it's smoothing right out I don't I don't have any complaints with that you can see where the high build quality of it uh, comes in because there are some obvious low spots where this piece was crazed by the turpentine and it's doing a good job of, of filling those in. And that's why you use a high build primer. It's made to be a, uh, to be a, a lightweight filler that takes care of all of those hundreds and thousands of tiny little imperfections that are separating you from a truly straight paint job. So that's, you know, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. No complaints there whatsoever. Um, let's see what happens when we add a little bit of water uh, because wet sanding is what you want when you either A, are looking for a really smooth finish and you're using a, uh, a real fine grit sandpaper. You can see a lot of that sanding dust laying right there on the, on the bench. My finger, that's good. That's your filler material right there. Um, anyway, um, wet sanding when you either A, want a really uh, smooth finish uh, or B, you just want to keep your your paper from clogging up so fast, which happens pretty quickly with a high build primer like that. I mean, you can see that right there. So it's uh, just kind of a of a convenience thing, um, and it also improves the efficiency of whatever sanding tool you're using because if it's not clogging up then that leaves it free to cut better and so you'll work faster and uh and that's that's not a bad thing so anyway it's doing exactly what i would expect it to do which is just sand nicely So I think, and this is again, this is a this is a pretty coarse piece of of sandpaper, um, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend this as the final sanding before laying a color coat on top of this, um, but for the purposes of this test, it's just fine. Um, and you know, when you're, when you're, when you're sanding a, 
relatively soft high build primer like this a relatively coarse sandpaper is is good because it uh, it cuts through it fast doesn't clog up as quickly and that's what you want so um, there we go uh, Not a damn thing to complain about with any of that. That is what that is. That is just exactly what um, a primer should should do. And I'm and I'm actually glad now that I kind of have this crazy chemical reaction that took place on this thing from the turpentine because it gives such a perfect illustration of how uh, how this primer is supposed to work. And this also shows why you know after this. It would be a good idea to go take it to the sink and wash it with soap and water before before any, going any further because look at all of that sanding dust that's built up in the in the crevices there. So anyway, good stuff. Very cool. I like it. Now, uh, what what I will move on to is I'm not going to spend any time uh, sanding this one. I don't think. Um, well, maybe a little bit. There's a couple of, of flecks in there, but you can see that it is super smooth. Um, so I may just knock down those, those little bits of trash and then leave it alone. And then, uh, I'll go on top of, uh, I'll go on top of, uh, well, I think I'm going to use this one. I'm going to go on top of this one with the gloss black base. And that'll give us a good idea of just how smooth uh, I was able to finish this out. Um, and how that translates down to spraying the, uh, the chrome effect on top of it. Because you know, any, anything chrome or metallic is going to show every little flaw uh, like it's highlighted in neon. So this will be a good test. We'll see what happens. One more thing I want to uh, address before I move on because it came up in the questions um, that some of the guys were asking last night. And that is, what's the difference between this, which is a water-based acrylic polyurethane surface primer, and this, which is a 2K urethane surface primer. Um, I think guys are a little bit confused by the fact that the names of both of these materials contain some of the same words and that they might be similar. They are nothing like the same um, other than the fact that you need to give both of them overnight to fully cure out before you uh, sand them. Um, the thing that's confusing is that um, they do sound like they should be similar based on the names, but the thing to remember about polymers is that they're a lot like flour. Uh, if you add one ingredient, you get pancakes. You add another ingredient, you get biscuits. And you do a few other different things and you get chocolate cake. Polymers are the very same way. So the fact that this has some of the same molecules and some of the same words in the name as this one does not necessarily mean that they're going to behave the same or do the same thing. Um, they do, in fact, both have a, a curing mechanism, which some people kind of get confused about because it's an acrylic. But what happens with an acrylic polyurethane is that at first it has to dry enough that it's open to oxygen and the oxygen is what causes it to catalyze and and cure um, and that's the basic mechanism for a lot of these types of of paints so it does in its own way kind of do the same thing as a 2k urethane it's just that it's catalyzed with the air you're breathing as opposed to this stuff right here. So anyway, hopefully that helps you guys understand a little bit of the chemistry a little bit better.